Dubai continuing to pay the honorable member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rita Lakes. Thank you, Speaker. We find ourselves here this morning discussing another attempt by this Liberal government to make a mad grab at power, a gross overreach. And we've seen it before. And we know that the NDP Liberal Alliance have started their heckles because they want to silence me, just like they want to silence people that they don't agree with. We know that at the very beginning of this pandemic, that the first thing that the Liberal government attempted to do was to make a mad grab at power. They wanted the ability to spend unlimited amounts of money and to raise taxes, tax Canadians as they see fit, without parliamentary oversight for nearly two years. Her Majesty's loyal opposition was awake at that late hour, and we stepped up and we stopped that overreach. And here we are at an early hour, on a Saturday morning, in an extraordinary sitting of this place, well, the government looks to use extraordinary processes to attack people that they disagree with. We heard from the Justice Minister. He said it on TV for all to hear that if you have political views that he disagrees with, they're coming for your bank account. Mm -hmm. Shame. Shame. Wow. And what? It's dangerous. And if you agree with the Justice Minister, you have the same distaste for the same politicians, maybe this time you're not worried. But what about the precedent that it sets when a future government, who has a different political view than you, goes after the bank accounts of their enemies or people that they disagree with? We in this place have a responsibility to safeguard the rights of all Canadians. We've heard a lot of talk about the impact in downtown Ottawa. And so I want to start with that very quickly. The residents of downtown Ottawa have seen protests and celebrations in their neighbourhoods for years. It's, a, it's really a feature, normally, of living at the heart of Canada's democracy. It has for them been of late anything but. Many of them are now represented in a class action lawsuit against the protesters. So I'd like to, for the House, share what their lawyer, a uh, fixture in the human rights legal community, has to say about the government's invocation of the Act. Quote, this seriously infringes on the charter rights of Canadians. End quote. That's the lawyer representing the folks downtown in Ottawa here. He said, and I quote again, I'm acutely aware of the trauma experienced by Ottawa residents. I fully agree that the Emergencies Act is a dangerous tool that is not required." End quote. So who better to pronounce on the urgency of the situation in downtown Ottawa than the lawyer who's representing, the human rights lawyer representing the, Ottawa, the downtown Ottawa residents? But let's talk about the other remedies that have been used to address people as part of this movement. We saw at the Ambassador Bridge, the Windsor border crossing, police of jurisdiction resolve the blockade of our international border. They did it over a two-day period without the use of the Emergencies Act. We saw in Coots, Alberta, the same result with the existing resources and the existing laws. And the police of local jurisdiction there, through police intelligence, identified that there were weapons and ammunition at a nearby site. They effectively interdicted it without a shot being fired, using the local laws and the local resources. Not an emergency. So we had the greatest public health crisis in more than a century that this government presided over, an economic downturn, the worst in a century that this government presided over, they deemed neither emergencies. We have an opioid crisis where people are dying on our streets every day. 
The government doesn't declare that an emergency. They're not taking extraordinary steps to deal with, to deal with that. But it goes back to that power grab. And it goes back to a pattern that we've seen with this Prime Minister. And every time he finds someone that he disagrees with, and this is no exception, he dismisses them, he degrades them, and he dehumanizes them. Millions of Canadians, because they disagree with them. He said they hold unacceptable views, and they take up space. He said they're mostly misogynists and racists. The majority of Canadians, millions of these same Canadians, have said that any signs or expressions of hate or intolerance are unacceptable, and they condemn them, and I condemn them. Anyone who commits an illegal act is individually accountable for that. But we have laws to address that. And the laws, the charges that are being laid in Ottawa are for mischief, conspiracy to commit. We don't require an emergency act to deal with these things. We have a public order operation taking place on the streets of Ottawa. It is not a national emergency. But it sure was a great opportunity for this Prime Minister to do those things that he does best, to divide Canadians. That's not the job of a Prime Minister. And it's a shame that he finds common cause amongst the government benches and with the third party in this House. History will not be kind to those who approve of this illiberal power grab. That's not who we are as Canadians. Many of the folks who are protesting at different places across Canada who are raising their voice, they're tired. We're all tired of COVID. They wanted a plan. They wanted to know how far until we get to that off-ramp. Because many of them, and I've met them, and I've spoken to them in front of this place, they're vaccinated. Some of them aren't. They just want to know when it's going to be over. We gave the government an opportunity to present a plan. We asked for it a year ago. We did it again in the last week. The government refused to provide a plan. Meanwhile, those that are following the science, the science presented by people like Dr. Moore in Ontario, have signaled when COVID measures will end in the jurisdictions that they're responsible for. Before these folks arrived in Ottawa or at those other locations in Canada, Dr. Tam, representing the Public Health Agency of Canada, said they needed a new plan. But we haven't heard that from this government. Because it's a great opportunity to pit neighbour against neighbour, family member against family member. The, an opportunity this Prime Minister never misses. Speaker, we're wide awake this morning. We've seen what this government has tried to do, and we're here to say that it's not acceptable. It's not our Canada. And folks who want to protest, they absolutely have the right to do that. Folks that want to, to use their right to freedom of expression, they absolutely have a right to do that. And there's a place for that on the lawn of Parliament Hill. And the folks that are moved through the public order measures out front or moved on days ago after visiting the seat of our democracy, they need, to come, they need to come to the appropriate places to protest. The lawns of their city halls and provincial legislatures and on the lawn of Parliament Hill and exercise their rights balanced with the responsibility of doing so in a lawful way. And that's what Canadians do. They don't try to affect extraordinary measures that subvert the regular rule of law and the charter rights that Canadians hold sacred. This Prime Minister knows better. His ministers know better. 
The backbenches know better. Let's find out when we vote on this if they're prepared to tell Canadians that this really is a country that respects the rule of law, a liberal democracy. Let's find out what Canada really stands for. Thank you, Speaker. Questions and comments, questions and comments. Uh, opposite with whom I served on the Ethics Committee talking about a Liberal democracy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are different um, tactics that can be used to discredit uh, one's adversary. There's discrediting uh, uh, someone with a constant barrage of, um, of insults and uh, slurs. There's distraction or deflection or whataboutism. Uh, and all of these are used to divide people. I'd like to ask the Honourable Member, which tactic is he using today? The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rita Lakes. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I talk about a liberal democracy because the government of this country is represented by the illiberal party of Canada, it would appear. And the tactic that I'm using today is reminding this government of the foundations of our democracy, and that's the rights of Canadians. And when Citizens are afraid of their government, and that's the goal that the government seeks. They've got it backwards. The government should be afraid of its citizens because our citizens hold the power. That's the keys to freedom. Question and commentary. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member, member for Manicouaga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague from Leeds, Grenville, Rideau Island, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. I have a, very, have a very simple question for him. Why did the Quebec government, the Legault government, succeed in two days without invoking any type of emergencies act? How did it succeed in fixing the, a similar situation? Thank you. Well, Thousand Islands and Rita Lakes. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the question very much from the member opposite. And uh, the, the Premier of Quebec was able to affect that result the same way that in Toronto they were able to affect the same result as they had in Montreal or in Quebec City. That's by using the existing laws of the local jurisdiction, using their existing resources, which is exactly what could be done here in Ottawa. It's what was done in Windsor. It's what was done in Coots. It's what's being done elsewhere. What we're seeing is this government try and confuse Canadians, conflate uh, you know, a, a couple of issues so that they can make a... Uh, a um, unjust grab at power. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Timmins James Bay. Mr. Speaker, one of the things that I really hope we're going to get out of this is a full inquiry to see the complete breakdown of law in Ottawa that allowed this thing to metastasize. The fact that dark money was used from American and from the Cayman Islands. These issues have to be fully investigated. But I'd like to ask my honourable colleague, because I know the, the interim leader of the opposition thought this was a real opportunity to let this thing drag on, and said day after day to go out and meet and talk with the leaders. Chris Barber, a vicious racist who likes truckers as long as they're white. Tamara Leash, a woman who wants to break up our country. I know some of the Conservatives are not, don't have a problem with that. Pat King, a man who talks openly about shooting the Prime Minister of the country, and I've never, ever heard a single Conservative stand up and say that those views are fundamentally wrong. There's a problem in our nation when we decide that it's okay to burn down the House of Democracy to watch the Prime Minister jump out the window to support people who talk about killing a Prime Minister. I want to hear him condemn that language. Well, member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rita Lakes. I condemn it. I also condemn the member opposite's party supporting this grab at power, propping up their coalition partners in the Liberal Party. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, what rationale was given behind closed doors, because we haven't heard the rationale. And we've laid out very clearly that the laws of local jurisdiction are effective enough. But instead, this government looks to settle scores with its political foes using an unprecedented power grab, and it's unacceptable. Questions and comments. Question and commentary. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Grove, Gulf Islands. I feel that the Honourable Member for Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes may, in re-watching his remarks there, regret any sense of equivalency between condemning 
people calling for the killing of our Prime Minister and the decision made by the NDP to vote in favour of the declaration. But my question was this. The Honourable Member said that the, that the law, the declaration, would allow the freezing of bank accounts, I think I got this right, from people you, the government doesn't agree with. And I'm not sure I'm going to vote on this. I really want to see clarity around what are the thresholds for the government interfering in the bank accounts of anyone. I want to see that clarity. But I don't think it's right to mislead Canadians into thinking, Mr. Speaker, that this law will allow a threshold of people you don't like, people you disagree with, and then you go freeze their bank accounts. Perhaps the member would like to clarify. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes, 30 seconds. For the member opposite, a question from Evan Solomon, host of CTV's Power Play, quote, a lot of folks said, I just don't like your vaccine mandates and I donated to this, now it's illegal, should I be worried that the bank can freeze my account? Minister of Justice and Attorney General, quote, if you're a member of a pro-Trump movement who is donating hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars to this kind of thing, you ought to be worried, end quote. So, if you support Donald Trump, the government's coming after you. That's unacceptable in a liberal democracy. Here, here. All right, we were doing really well, so I know we're, we're getting questions in, so we're getting, everybody's having an opportunity to ask questions. I, I almost got to the, to, the par, to, the, to the party once again. We're almost getting to the second round, so this is, this is doing really, really well. So, uh, let's, let's keep it up. Uh,